There we go. So now we're recording. Uh, so let me uh, hand over the floor to um, our MEC2 Group 12, uh, the Gator Rays, to present um, their heliostat design. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our final oral presentation. We are Gator Rays, and we will be Gainesville's most modular heliostat. So our team consists of seven, de seven different mechanical engineers. So we have here, Robert Bruner, Sophia Cruzan, Lance Herlong, Rachel Heinlein, Kaden Madsen, myself, as well as Nicholas Savedra. All righty, so this presentation will consist of uh, the following outline, hedgehog concept, product overview, we'll take you through the subsystem analyses, um, some of the unique features to our system, um, some extra views so you guys can understand our design, um, overall cost table for um, the prototype, as well as the total um, mass manufacturability of it, summary and conclusion. So without further ado, we'll go into the hedgehog concept. Um, so when we were designing this, um, we really had people at the heart of our design. What I mean by that is we were aiming to bring low cost solutions easy installation and a future-proof design. That way we could lower the overall cost and make a heliostat um, field electricity more accessible to several homes. In this case, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, we are using readily available off-the-shelf parts, about 72%. Um, we aimed to make sure our design would be able to handle harsh conditions in Las Vegas and we allowed accessibility and maintenance and upkeep, ease of access for um, maintenance, general maintenance, as well as easy installation. And yeah. Moving into our product overview, here you can see uh, two different images of our overall system. So on the right-hand side, going from the top down, we're gonna start with the mirror surface of which we have four. Uh, then these mirrors are rotated via the motor actuation system which actuates it in two different axes. These motors are controlled by the control subsystem, which is enclosed in that small enclosure on the right-hand side. And finally, our entire product sits atop this base structure, which is highlighted at the bottom. Over on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see what exactly a single mirror subassembly looks like. There are four of these on the Heliosat device, and these smaller mirror subassemblies um, ultimately bolt up to the main central axis to complete the entire product. Now diving further into the product overview, we'll highlight the central axis of rotation. Here you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, this is powered by a worm gear. It's a 40 to one reduction using a NEMA 17 stepper motor. This allows us to have an adequate amount of torque uh, for all the types of rotations we need, as well as a high level of accuracy, much exceeding that um, 0.5 degrees of accuracy required by the customer metric. You can also see this central axis has all of the mirrors rotating uh, together in unison. So you can see that for this design, we have all the mirrors going together in unison for the central axes, whereas they are individualized for the secondary axes. And again, moving on to that secondary axis, this is driven by a spur gear as opposed to the worm gear, because again, we are moving into more of an individual axis. There's less total weight and mass being moved around. So for this time, the separate motors are only being geared down four to one through these spur gears. Uh, you can see the axis of rotation, um, the little graphic on the right-hand side of your screen. Moving on to the reflective surface subsystem. Um, these are the needs we were trying to meet and the solutions we provided um, all encompassing are four one, uh, 0 0.25 meter squared mirrors resulting in a total of one meter squared of reflection area. Um, we provided ample spacing as you'll see later in our design just to um, mitigate shading. Uh, we provided low cost materials, off the shelf parts, and 3D printed parts that way to lower the cost and get as close as that as to the $100, $100 per meter squared metric. Um, we provided easily easy cleaning methods, a replaceable film that will last 10 years, so it only needs to re be replaced once. And to meet that one megawatt customer needs metric, we went ahead and ensured that there would be 1,087 heliostats in the field or at least calculated it. 
And that would provide an equivalent of 4,348 suns um, in solar concentration reflection. So for our reflective surface design, um, it utilizes four square mirrors to ensure a simple manufacturing process in which re reflectivity can be maximized and shading can be minimized. A reflective mylar film with a reflective efficiency of 92% is placed upon a 3D printed backing made from ABS plastic. This material is low in cost and high in stiffness to allow for it to be structurally sound. For our first reflective surface analysis, um, the lift force on the surface is calculated using an assumed wind gust of about 35 miles per hour to or 15.5 meters per second to meet customer need number 16, which will be further discussed in the base structure subsystem. The coefficient of lift is calculated using the angle of attack throughout an average day, which is also known as the angle at which wind reaches the heliostat. Um, the critical or stalling angle is typically around 15 to 20 degrees for many airfoils, which is why that's where that's the angle at which the graph ends at. For our thermal input capability, it can be calculated by multiplying the solar constant of 1,000 watts per meter squared by the total area and the optical efficiency of 92%. In order to get a value of 920 watts per module, the required one megawatt is then divided by this thermal input value in order to find the minimum amount of heliostats, um, heliostat modules needed. Uh, then the solar concentration for the entire field is calculated by multiplying the amount of mirrors per module by the amount of modules and then the power of one sun per mirror, which then will give us a solar concentration value of about 4,348 suns. While designing our base structure, we wanted to go with a non-excessive, straightforward approach that uses off-the-shelf parts to ensure the lowest cost possible. Furthermore, we wanted to guarantee that the heliostat will withstand strong winds and extreme temperatures with a minimum factor safety of two and a lifetime of at least 20 years. So moving forward to our visual of our base structure design, we have two steel bars connected together at the top of the steel rod. These bars are three feet long and are driven one foot into the ground. Additionally, four inch thick concrete slabs are poured around the rods directly at the surface. These concrete slabs will lock the rods into position and will ensure extra support against strong winds. With that being said, we move on to our base structure analysis. Here you see the base structure analyses for the base structure. Um, we assume a strong wind gust about 35 miles per hour, which is about 15 and a half meters per second. Um, this force of wind over the surface area is about 157 newtons. Um, the moment of the base structure, um, two feet above the ground, um, comes out about 48.01 newtons, newton meters per rod, with a bending stress of about 42 megapascals. Um, this comes out with a factor of safety of, of around nine, which is greater than two, which is what we were trying to meet. Um, go to the next slide. This high factor of safety allows us to have a low deflection. Um, also critical load comes out about 80 kilonewtons, which again meets our, our threshold. And the deflection comes down to about two millimeters or about uh, 0.185 degrees. So as previously stated, the maximum force applied to the heliostat base structure will be approximately 157.5 newtons, which yields a high factor of safety of 8.95. However, the factor of safety for infinite life is approximately two, assuming that the endurance limit for the steel is conservative 35% of the ultimate tensile strength. Moving into the motor actuation subsystem analysis based on our customer metrics, you can see that we are required to have a tracking error of plus or minus 0.25 degrees, which we have met on our secondary axis at 0.45 degrees total or plus or minus 0.225 degrees. On the long, the central axis, this is even smaller due to that 40 to one worm gear reduction. Additionally, we must be able to focus on a position up to 100 meters high. And we have done this by up to 180 degrees movement um, along our axes. 
We've also attained a cost of around $100 per meter squared by using cheaper stepper motors, as well as utilizing 3D printed ABS plastic gears. We've also maximized the use of OTS parts and only slightly modified OTS parts in order to further keep that cost down. And then we have a factor of safety that far exceeds the minimum factor of safety of two as specified by the customer design with a long lifetime um, and operating conditions that will be more than adequate for the Nevada desert. As you can see with this close up of our motor actuation design along the secondary axis, our design has three total NEMA stepper motors that I've mentioned previously. And this allows the total reflective area to rotate about two separate axes. For this secondary axis, you can see that we have the mirror pivot axis up at the top with that larger spur gear, followed by the smaller spur gear on the NEMA stepper motor shaft. This entire system is covered by the mirrors as they rotate, um, as to keep debris and fingers and anything else out of these gears. Um, and this one to four gear ratio provides 0.45 degrees of accuracy, as mentioned below before, which is within the customer metric. Moving on to the analysis and the balance of forces along the system, here you can see a close up graphic of how exactly the secondary axis moves over time as it rotates these panels into position. Um, through this analysis, we have determined that our ABS 3D printed gears are more than adequate for the standard forces and wind forces that are involved with our design. Um, and that is also shown on the next slide. So based off of the ultimate tensile strength of ABS plastic um, and the affirmation calculations, we have a factor of safety of around 9.7 for this gear system. Um, and this is why we have chosen these specific gears um, for, these, for this motor actuation subsystem as they are cheap, they're easy to manufacture, and they're well within uh, this factor of safety specifications based off our customer needs. Moving over onto the central axis, this axis has a lot more forces at play due to the fact that all four mirrors rotate along the central axis. They are held by the mirror platform holder that you can see up in the upper right hand corner of your screen. This is a very critical component of our design as it has two mirrors hanging off of it at all times and is being rotated by the square central shaft, kind of like a lock and key mechanism um, down the center. So one of the reasons why we have done the finite element analysis on this particular part is we wanted to make it as lightweight and easy to manufacture cheaply as possible, hence cutting out the truss-like formations. But we also wanted to make sure that under normal operating conditions and under wind force conditions, um, this, this mirror platform holder would not deflect or break um, given those types of conditions. So we have found that under maximum conditions, the deflection is less than 0 0.013 millimeters, which again is more than adequate for the degree of accuracy that we are looking to attain. Um, we have found this um, through that FEA model as well as calculations on the worm gears, which have a factor of safety in excess of 9.5. The other advantage of going with worm gears is that they are non-back drivable. So as this is the central axis about which all the mirrors rotate, if we were to have a windstorm condition that is critical to the point where we needed to go into a wind safe formation of having all of the mirrors perfectly horizontal, once our heliostat reaches this wind safe position, we're not relying on the holding torque of our NEMA stepper motors to keep that wind position. Likewise, if there is a power outage during this windstorm, so long as we are in the wind safe position, the mechanical holding force of the worm gears will keep our system safe and stabilized. So moving on to the control subsystem, the microcontroller that our team ended up utilizing is an Espressif ESP32 microcontroller. Originally, we had wanted to use a Raspberry Pi Zero but uh, due to supply issues, as well as just wanting a cheaper bull cost, we went with the ESP32. It is Wi-Fi enabled, so we are able to track the sun through its daily path via GPS and or hard coding the solar position uh, via location. The latency is 0.3 seconds per message, which is uh, sufficient for a system that does not need hyper speed um, capabilities. Again, it can control the actuation system up to 180 degrees so that we can focus sunlight onto the top of the receiving tower and it has a uh, decent range to make sure that all of the modules can receive and send signals. And the spec out temperature range is within, uh, well within the range of Las Vegas, Nevada. So the control system will be fixed inside of an ABS uh, printed box on top of one of the steel base shafts. So you can see in here that there is the microcontroller fixed to the back as well as 
um, stepper motor amplifier or drivers. So since the stepper motor or since the microcontroller does not have enough input power to power the motors, we have these amplifiers so that they can actually you know, work. Uh, wireless transmission does allow us to update these modules remotely. So someone will not have to go up to each module and work on the coding of it um, one by one. Everything can be done via Wi-Fi. A uh, big concern of ours being that this system is in a desert is um, the heat. So to try to take um, heat into consideration, we utilize natural convection. So as the cool air rises through these uh, vents in the bottom, it'll they the cool wind goes past the stepper motor drivers as well as the microcontroller and then out this hood. The hood is there to prevent rain from falling onto and staying within the uh, control system box. And also um, will be fitted with like a mesh to present, prevent uh, any sort of bugs or animals from residing inside of our system. The control system design uh, with the ESP32, uh, we also really liked the ESP32 ESP because it showcased the Wi-Fi capabilities, 150 megabits per second, which is more than enough for the over-the-air updates. Um, it also showcases a lot of low energy um, innovations, uh, such as a coprocessor to run in a low energy state, Bluetooth low energy, 3.3 um, volt power input when running, which is available on site. And um, it is more than enough to uh, be able to track the sun with our local sun tracking capability. Um, also, a major concern was overheating. And this is certified with the JDEC standard, uh, certifying that it is reliable in 125 Celsius conditions for 1,000 hours. Uh, going over the thermal analysis for the control system, uh, we were worried about heat. So for heat transfer in the system, we have a uh, the stepper drivers come with um, heat sinks, aluminum heat sinks. Um, this calculation shows the amount of uh, energy that would have to consume to reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be too hot to touch for someone working on it. Um, as you can see, we it consumes it would have to consume about eight and a half watts uh, in order to reach that temperature, and the drivers only consume 6.6 .6 watts of energy uh, during use, so they will not reach this threshold. We also want to touch on a couple aspects that make our design unique, some of the more nuanced details. As you mentioned before, over 72% of our design is off-the-shelf parts. And we really wanted to make it a big staple point of our design to use as many low-cost off-the-shelf parts as possible. So one example of this on the left-hand side of your screen is using a standard bearing housing and eight millimeter inner diameter skateboard bearing. So because of the mass production levels of skateboards, the fact that they're sealed bearings to protect against water, dust, debris, um, any sort of elements, they provide a perfect um, bearing surface for our central axis. Um, so that is again, why we have gone with something right there, as opposed to maybe a less used bearing that would have been higher manufacturing costs or somewhere in between uh, with a custom part. Moving on to the middle image, you will see that we have the mirror holder system that we talked about earlier uh, with the finite element analysis along that central shaft. But you'll also see where the spur gears are located and the NEMA stepper motor mirrored on the other side of that mirror um, is mounting points for another stepper motor that is currently not in place. These mirrors are currently attached uh, with the light gray axle shaft that you see at the top. But should either the customer decide in the future that they want to go to more individual axes of rotation, and simply for the ease of manufacturability, again, having one product, one type of part that is manufactured for each of our four mirror subsystems, regardless of whether or not they carry a motor. Uh, these are just some further examples of how we were able to shave a little bit of cost while also making sure that our design is a little bit modular um, in the sense of where the motors are placed uh, with respect to the mirrors. And then moving over to the image on the right, Again, because we're using a lot of ABS plastic components, which are gonna be 3D printed for the prototype and then injection molded for the final design. We know that threading into plastic, plastic is a soft material, it's out in the desert. Um, that might not hold up for 20 years of lifetime. So we are using threaded inserts, threaded metal inserts into our ABS plastic for these fasteners. So again, it's just the smaller attention to detail of making sure that these are the types of things that could fail over a 20 year lifetime, um, but by combining OTS parts, um, and making sure our fasteners are up to strength, uh, we've been able to make a design that lasts well within the customer's metrics.
Last but not least, as far as our unique design, is we really wanted to focus on the manufacturability aspect. Obviously, when you want to design a heliostat system that is over a meter in terms of total square area, that can get very large and heavy very quickly. And so from a manufacturing and assembly standpoint, that could require more personnel, a larger manufacturing plant, a bigger production line. And so by having our entire heliostat be broken down into four basic subsystems, which you can see here on the right, uh, with minimal components that are very easy to install, it means that these could be made in bulk quite easily and then installed in the field once the base system is placed. So our entire design features easy manufacturability and easy installation on the field due to its kind of modular design. Moving on to the cost analysis. Um, here we can see that there is a prototype cost of $120 for 31 cents and a mass production cost per heliostat of $100.28. The way we broke it down was there's off-the-shelf parts, modified off-the-shelf parts, which include steel stock, where we may drill holes to mount the main support, um, which is a relatively minor cost overall. Um, we have raw materials that include cement and the 3D printed filament. We have assembly labor, which will be overseas, manufacturing labor, which will consist of 3D printing and injection molding, for the mass production. Um, and the energy consumption is what it would cost to run the heliostat for one day, assuming that you wouldn't receive any benefits that same day. In summary, there are many aspects that make our design stand out. Modular features allow the design to be manipulated and changed as the customer sees fit, as well as the Wi-Fi system, which allows for remote updates. Off-the-shelf parts make up 72% of the total cost, and this allows for easy assembly and helps bring the cost down. This means our cost is competitive compared to other designs at $100.28 per module. The design is overall simple but effective. It is easily manufacturable and installed in the field. We want to say thank you to our corporate sponsors for all that they do for us. We also want to thank our UF professors, TAs, and faculty. Thank you for attending our presentation and let us know if you have any questions. All right, great. <clears throat> Thanks for your presentation. Uh, oh, we're getting uh, applause, virtual applause um, from the audience. So nicely done. Um, if um, <clears throat> our panelists have questions, uh, we've got, that looks like about 20 minutes to, uh, to have a technical discussion with the group. Hi hey guys, this is Tom Singer from Northern Grumman. Um, can you go back to the, the uh, just a couple of slides earlier where we were showing kind of the animation of uh, like the, uh, yeah, that one right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk about your reflecting surface and what's underneath it? Yeah. yeah so or Nick, ahead, can you Katie. take this one? I'll just, oh, okay. just quickly right, I'll take for the, it. yeah, I was just going to say quickly, as far as the animation goes, um, I just made the clear mounting, uh, the mounting surface clear for the purpose of this assembly, just that so you could see it in its function. Uh, but I'm sure Nick will touch on that as well. Okay. Yeah, so we were planning on going ahead and placing the Mylar film over the ABS plastic, um, ABS 3D like injection molded um, plastic. And when, when you're when you say that, which can you indicate which of these parts you're talking about? Yeah, of course. Give me one second. Um, so that I would be the clear piece that is shown in this animation. Okay, so clear flat piece of plastic that you're mounting the mirror to. Exactly. How compliant is that clear or is that piece of plastic? I feel like Caden might be able to answer that a little better. <laughs> Could, right. Mr. Singer, would you mind explain a little more by by compliant what you mean? Yeah, I mean when the wind blows on that how much is it going to deform and how is that going to impact your ability to direct energy to the collector? Uh, so that's the reason why it's mounted on that kind of eye formation of ABS that you see there. That's the structural backing uh, for the mm -hmm. Mylar film and the ABS plastic sheet that, that you see on top. Uh, so mm -hmm. we touched on a little bit earlier, but we're expecting only a deflection of about 0.18 degrees. Is that considering like, I mean, the most uh, the flexible part of your setup there is going to be in the center of the unsupported edges. 
Right. So how how much is it going to rotate as it's kind of making, uh, you know, if, if the wind's blowing more or less straight at it, right, it's going to deform into a U shape, or if it's from behind, it'll, you know, kind of like an N shape. Um, and that's going to change where it's directing the light to when it reflects, correct? Yes, I see what you're saying. So how much is that going to affect your ability to direct light to your target? Could I? I... Unfortunately, we, ha we hadn't gone into the depth of how much this ABS sheet in particular is deflecting. Um, our goal with the design was to have the eye formation be the backing um, and calculate the deflection of the eye formation, uh, which was minimal, um, but we did not go into the- Yeah, the that is going to be minimal, but that's not what's going to control your ability to direct your intended amount of power to your target. All right, so uh, let's see, beyond that, um, you had uh, you'd mentioned, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say good stuff, right? You, you hit the $100 cost and, and I don't think any team has achieved that. So, um, you know, I, I think your design maybe potentially needs some modification that could in, increase costs, but at least what you've got now, you're the only team that I've seen that's within even, you know, double what the, the intended cost is. So, so that's a very good job. Um, you mentioned that you're not planning to 3D print things for production. You're, you're designing to be injection molded, which again is good because 3D printing is, is not a great way to mass produce parts. Um, let's see, when you, uh, when you mentioned at the very beginning that you're gonna need 1,087 of these heliostats, that's based on what a thousand watts per meter squared and ninety two percent reflectivity. Yes, the ninety two percent yeah. reflectivity is from the mylar film, and the a thousand mm -hmm. watts per meter squared is an estimate of what the sun, um, how much energy the sun gives off per meter squared. Uh, I'm familiar. Are, are any of you from out of state? No, so no, so no. You're all Florida. Florida. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you know anybody who lives in, say, Maine or Alaska? I have a couple of friends, yeah. It's it's cold up there, right? Yeah. Do you, do you know why it's cold up there? Several Latitude. reasons. Because, because the sun's rays are coming in basically at an angle to the ground, right? So on your one meter squared of the ground, the projected area of that one meter squared is significantly less in Maine or in Alaska than it is here in Florida, right? So as you're rotating your mirrors around to redirect sunlight from uh, the sun to a tower, you're changing the projected area, right? So you're no, no, no longer gathering a meter squared of solar energy, you're gathering significantly less than that. So. Um, unless your tower happens to be in a direct line with the sun from your heliostat, you're going to be less than your thousand watts per meter squared there. So that's going to be a significant yeah. impact uh, on top of a whole bunch of other impacts that are, are going to raise the number of uh, modules that, that you need to build. However, I'll say that's even better for your cost, right? Because you're, you're going to mass produce even more of these things than you're planning on. So your cost per unit might go down. Yeah, initially we actually assumed uh, 2000 heliostat module and once we did this calculation, we lowered it. Um, so that's a very good point. I haven't, I didn't consider that when making these calculations. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would suggest, I mean, these, these types of problems have been considered and, and I'd suggest kind of looking around uh, for examples in the industry, um, a, a term you might want to Google is direct normal insulation. Um, that, that'll kind of put you on the right path on this. Okay. Do you think that because we're looking at Las Vegas, um, and it is a very sunny location in the desert. It's very hot. Would it would it still be significant to consider that oh, yeah. as much as it would? Yeah, be in because the if you so say say your say the sun's directly overhead at noon, right? And your tower is like horizontal is is basically at ground level, right? And you need to redirect the light ninety degrees, so you're going to angle your mirror at forty five degrees, right? Right. So what is the projected area of your mirror? from the sun right it's going to be change. like 70 yeah. percent of your of your total area because it's at that 45 degree angle to the sunlight right so now you're starting off you know just just in that situation uh with what like 750 watts uh on your one meter squared of reflecting surface okay 
Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Any other questions? I see Sean's hand raised. I'm not sure. Hi, yes. Um, yeah, so I want to start off with some really good notes and sorry for the background noise. There's a lawnmower and my dog who's freaking out. It's um, weird right outside the Cummins building like that. <laughs> so yeah, I really want to touch on a, a couple of really good things that you guys have done that I haven't seen really in other groups. So first one is the underlying theme, how you're always comparing your project metrics to the customer requirements. That is huge. I loved how you had that initial slide, you know, for each subsection showing that because yeah, in, in industry, that is the most important part of a presentation is showing how you're meeting the deliverable. And I've been looking for something like this from other groups and I've never seen a group do it as well as you guys did. So really good job there. Um, also even just hitting on it throughout your presentation as well. That was excellent. Another part that Tom mentioned was thinking past the prototype stage, especially when it comes to 3D printing. Um, Cause yeah, full scale and production, that's not a realistic um, option a lot of the time. Sometimes it might be, but oftentimes it's not. So it was great how you, um, yeah, thought past that prototyping stage. And again, mentioning the customer, you mentioned, you know, how they might want some modularity involved. Um, along with the 3D printing part, you also mentioned how, uh, I think it was for the fasteners to reinforce those, you, you know, you had a, a metal rod going through those to help with durability. So that was also really great. So well done there. Did have a couple questions. So I think you had some calculations for the um, the teeth, your 3D printed teeth um, breaking, but did you also consider how those teeth might wear down over time since they're made out of a, a polymer and how that could affect the, the rotation that you're, you're trying to achieve with that, um, whatever that, that degree of accuracy that you needed? Um, that is not something that we went into detail in uh, for this application. Um, we did just see that it came out as like a factor of safety of 10, which kind of made me think that it would be okay in most situations, which is probably wrong in some cases. Um, for fact, for like lifetime, I haven't quite gotten into it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think you you guys put a lot of effort into, you know, maybe sheer stress or if they were going to break off. But yeah, something to keep in mind, especially when working with the, the softer materials is how that could wear over the lifetime and, and you know, if your teeth are now round, how is that going to affect uh, the, the performance? And one more question that I had, this one's a lot more open-ended instead of pointed, but what would you say is the riskiest failure mode that could arise during normal operation? And by highest risk, I mean, that can either mean the highest likelihood of failure or um, a failure that would be the most expensive to repair. That's a the, great question. <laughs> oh, okay. I was going to say it would probably end up being those uh, plastic parts that are printed or injected, injected molded. Those are the weakest parts, um, especially with cost, because you'd have to go to a manufacturer or a supplier and go get those made. Like, okay, could, would you mind porting out which which parts you're referring to? Uh, well, you can even see what we're looking at. I don't know how to do it with my thing. <laughs> um, like the supports for the 3D mirrors as uh, suggested by Mr. Singer, um, that's gonna have a lot of deformation involved, um, worrying about um, it being, not being able to efficiently point light rays for the sun. Um, that's probably gonna be the biggest thing. Um, Overall, I'm not really worried about the the steel structures because um, again, those meet our factor of safety by temp nine, and I'm most worried about those plastics, especially for wear. Yeah, I also think one other part that might be a little delicate would be um, on the installation side. In this slide, you can see that there. Let me go ahead and point it out. But there's a little cap right here and 
you know, that could be a point of concern where if there's a lot of stress going on due to wind forces throughout the body of the mirror, this might be the easiest point of failure due to it being in two parts. Um, so that might be something else we can look at further. Okay, yeah, great answers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for your comments and your questions. Yeah, of course. Is there anybody else? I think Dr. Chesney wanted to say something. I have an answer to that, that unfortunately, uh, we engineers as a whole have not been considering, I would say the highest risk failure is cyber attack of the wireless systems and having someone come in and reprogram it. And, you know, maybe you don't even realize it's been hacked and then a plane flies overhead and they fry it or something. Or instead of reflecting to the top of the tower, they bring it down and reflect to the control structure and bad things happen. So um, I, I think we as engineers need to be extra careful when we consider wireless communications and making sure they're uh, secure, even if it's something specified by the customer. That is outside the box thinking. Yeah, that's it really, really shouldn't be. We need to consider that every single time we have wireless. I got a, a couple questions, if y'all don't mind. Oh, let me turn on my video so you don't you're not yeah. looking at a blank screen. There we go. Um, if you wouldn't mind, take me back to there was a slide that you said the lifetime had to be over twenty, and your response was infinite lifetime. Was this in reference to the base structure? Yeah. Yes, right here. Awesome. Tell me what you mean by infinite lifetime. I mean, I'm not like, you know, a Marvel superhero here, and I'm doubting your heliostat is either. So kind of give me a little bit more detail on what you mean by infinite life. And remember, she's not an engineer. I am not an engineer. Correct. I am business 100%. So when it comes to this thing we call the endurance limit, Mm -hmm. uh, steel has an endurance limit. So that just means it'll last up to, so if you put a certain stress on it, it can last up to a certain point. Um, there's a whole graph that goes through it. It's a very theoretical thing, but basically that steel is gonna stay there until it corrodes away and nothing. The, uh, so when we say infinite life, maybe not like, you know, till the end of the universe, the end of time, but much longer than 20 years. Is kind of what we're getting at there with the stress that's going to be applied to it for a uh, maximum wind load i don't know if that makes sense i'm trying to explain it without getting too technical i'll say you got to talk to me like i'm a five-year-old when it comes to these things that's the way i like to describe it so so it's our way of saying it's going to last a lot longer than 20 years okay well, so even with those wind loads applied constantly to it or so as an constantly. investor side when i read this I will, granted, it, it sounds like the engineers understand what it says infinite life, what it means, but as an investor, I immediately get suspicious. So maybe just- Yeah, that's just maybe not a good way to put it. I, I totally right, agree. Right, yeah, maybe just okay. change the wording on, on, you know, instead of saying infinite life, saying 40 plus years or something yeah, along those lines. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Believe yeah, me, okay. little things like that will jump out at us because uh, it's a lot of money that I'm looking to invest, so- I got to make sure I trust y'all. Um, second thing is, can you go to the cost slide? Or uh, yeah, the cost, the cost slide, please. If I can speak English today. Perfect. Okay, so I want to um, definitely kind of parrot what Tom said that it's very impressive that y'all are able to get this much closer to that $100 limit. Um, and I love, love, love the fact that y'all have included labor costs in here. I cannot even tell you, I think it's a running joke now amongst the panelists, how many times I harp on groups for not putting labor costs. Because as you can see, it's not just a tiddly watt amount. You know, your labor between assembly and manufacturing is gonna be more than your raw material. This is more than your modified OTS. So it is a big thing to consider always, always, always when you do these things. So I want to give you kudos on that. I will say it does make me slightly hesitant that every other group I've seen has been more than double 
And so I'm like, how in the world did they get it down so much? So if I was truly investing in this, you know, and if we had hours and hours, I would, you know, want to see your cost sheet. I would want to see this truly broken down and, and investigate it to make sure that what you're saying is correct to what I'm seeing as well. But assuming that this is correct, and it sounds like it would be because your parts are not overly complicated, then this is big kudos, big, 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 good job. Uh, one last question. And again, this may be that I'm not an engineer. So you got to kind of tell me, no, Julia, this is fine. Um, is the, the slide that you had, this is going to sound terrible with the, the box with all the technical things in there that had the vent on the bottom and the hood on the top. Wow, if you, no, She's not She's referring one. to the control system. Yeah, the control box. See, I told you I'm not an engineer. You got to work with me here. There we go, there we yes. go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, this may just be my lack of knowledge. Uh, so there's a vent on the bottom that you're saying the air is going to come up through the vent, cool everything down and come out the top. In Nevada, I believe it's very sandy. So how do you prevent sand and dust and all that from going through the vent and getting in there? Well, um, so with the airflow, um, we were mostly concerned with rain bugs. And so we applied a filter on the top end of the vent um, and the, the, when I mean filter, I just mean like a little mesh screen and it's small enough to not allow things to come through. When it comes through the bottom, um, I think that's a little intense for, you know, a bunch of debris to come through the bottom. I think that's going to be intense. We also angled the slots a little bit. So it's not just like holes in the bottom and, you know, you can just put your finger in there. It's, they're going to be a little slanted. Um, so I think when it comes to that, it was, that, that was kind of what we were expecting. We weren't expecting sand to just rise up through. And if there is, there probably is going to be some debris and dirt, but nothing to affect um, detrimentally. But I don't know if one of my other teammates has a better response. Another, yeah, exactly. Another thing I was going to touch on is part of the reason why we put the control box module up high on the heliostat located near that central axis was to get it away from the ground level, um, the sand, the dirt, debris, that kind of stuff. So it is... You know, situated a little bit higher, we have the mesh screens covering the intake and outtake, um, as well as the little slits. So it's kind of, um, you have to weigh your pros and cons between potentially overheating your components with a lack of airflow, um, you know, reducing yeah, you airflow. you gotta have something in there to cool it vents. Um, We have to have some form of airflow. Um, and so this was um, our best case scenario. Yeah, I have to say, when I saw this picture, I loved, loved, loved it. You get that when air gets hot, it rises. And you have designed your case to uh, take advantage of natural convection. And I, I like that it's off the ground. And even if you did, you know, somehow have some sand that comes up in here, where's it gonna go? It, you know, it's heavy, it's, it's not gonna go all over the place and get up into the electronics. It, it would wanna fall back down again. And, yeah, if you open up a 20-year-old computer, you will see that inside there is dust all over the parts and it's it's still working okay. So, um, okay, see, and that's where my lack of engineering knowledge comes in. Um, so I appreciate y'all explaining it to me. So, you know, again, as an investor, which you have me who has no idea, but also if you go out in the real world, a lot of them don't have any idea either. So explaining that that it's not, I guess it's a non-issue um, is helpful. Yeah, of course. And thank you for asking so, the question, Julia. Yeah. While, while we're looking here, uh, you, you designed it for efficient convection. I appreciate that too. That was something that I had written down in my notes. Um, but is there a thermal analysis to demonstrate whether that convection is sufficient to keep your uh, components cool? Um, our thermal analysis uh, focuses more on the heat sinks and having it supply fresh air from the outside. That was an assumption that was made. Um, the convection analysis is something that we have, but I don't have in front of me to give you. So if you wanted to have that later, maybe. Um, but no, I don't you, have it in the you did, you did do a thermal analysis to ensure that, you know, with 
with natural convection that you're going to maintain a, a reasonable temperature for your electronics? Correct. Okay. It's not in here. Yeah. Is there any sort of consideration in that analysis for the fact that the flow has got to turn and that's going to uh, somewhat inhibit that convection? Uh, you mean like blockages? Yeah. Oh, with, with the hood design. So yes, we're basically basing the exit path, the smaller exit path um, for the total convection going through the system because the hood's basically required. We can't have open vents straight up to the top, even though that would be the best cooling scenario. Mm -hmm. um, that's also why the total area inside the box is larger as well. Okay. Um, and then the one other thing, if, if you don't mind going back to one of the, uh, the slides that shows uh, your, your mirror support. Um, are you speaking about the base structure or? The, the mm -hmm. like actual, like the rotating, the reflector support. Okay, all righty. Yeah, yeah, give me a second the, to pull the, it up. I think I know what you're talking about. It was towards the end. Yeah, that kind of like truss okay. structure. Yeah, let me let me go ahead and pull up another slide. My computer's um, a lot of yeah, you kind of see it on. there. <laughs> and maybe that maybe that's the best view that that you get of it. I, I see this like channel of notches. Oh, sorry. Underneath your uh, uh, underneath the the plastic piece here, right? And you kind of see it in in this view on the right hand side. What is that channel of notches for? So it's, it's kind of multifold. For one, it prevents um, further surface area for wind to attach to as um, it's potentially getting blown around in, these, in, the, in the desert. But it's also just to reduce the overall weight and in turn production well, that's, cost of this I, part. I think you're talking about maybe the, the cutouts, uh, the triangular shaped cutouts through here. And I, I can certainly appreciate that, yeah, I mean, for, for lightning, for material reduction, I, I think those are, are Nice, but I'm specifically looking like right under your reflector, that sort of eye-shaped piece within those triangular cutouts at the bottom of each one of those ribs, it looks like you've put a semicircular notch. Oh, okay. So that is actually from an earlier design iteration that, that we could have removed. Um, essentially, when we first started this design, and like many of the other groups, we're dealing with high costs, we had a metal axle running along the eye formation that was set into mm -hmm. that semicircle notch. And that was later um, deleted, and we increased the total diameter of the axle up to 22 millimeters so that the ABS plastic would be strong enough to be self-supporting that sense. Um, and so when we made that iteration, we just kept the notch along the bottom as opposed to adding the material back uh, because it was not needed. I would, I would greatly prefer that you add the material back. Okay. I mean, not, not that I think you'll have any sort of stress problems on that particular piece in that particular location, but it, it's an unnecessary stress riser. Right. That makes sense. And I think you can see the notch a lot better in this image now that I know what you're speaking yeah. about. Yeah. 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 Are there any other questions? I just Not got long. one more comment. Um, I just okay. want to say thank you guys all for dressing up, looking nice, looking professional. You know, your backgrounds are nice. You don't have random anime backgrounds, anything like that. It, it From someone on the outside looking in, when I see all of y'all dressed professional, acting professional, look professional, it really helps to give that sense that you know what you're doing and that you have your act together. So it helps me as an investor feel much more confident in what you're saying. Um, so I know that's such a little thing. And uh, to be honest, even us in the business world don't consider it all the time. But, you know, that's definitely something appearances says a lot. And y'all, you know, all putting in the effort to look nice really does help to sell it. So I want to give you, you know, kudos and good job on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, um, go ahead, Dr. Trom. I see you were about to speak. Oh, no, I just say if, if, uh, if there are no more um, questions or comments from the panel, uh, we, could, we could probably wrap it up here. Yeah, good job. I think we'll leave. And typically we leave and we leave this open for you guys to debrief yourselves. <laughs> good awesome. job. Thank you guys for coming.
Yeah, thank, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, we'll see everybody. Uh, well, you guys don't have a choice. Well, some of you have a choice. Well, I was going to say we'll see you all in Mech 3 next semester, but <laughs> some of you might have, might have escaped. So maybe not all of you, but anyway. Okay. I'll leave you alone. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Strom. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Strom. Bye.